Um, I'm also very proud to be here with, with you, John. Um, we've missed you from the centre, but uh, you've been elevated to greater things, I think. Um, I'd also like to thank Ian, Ian Ritchie, who I first met um, it related to a first trip to Bosnia, and I understand it's your last festival. So uh, I think you're probably going to be missed. And also to Nigel, Nigel Osborne, um, who well, we just keep running into each other, don't we? Um, I wasn't going to talk about this group of young men, so I've just quickly improvised my way out of the first half of what I was going to talk about. Um, what I think was most important about that, that group, we initially agreed to go for six visits, six weekly visits, and the six weeks turned into um, two months, turned into three months, six months. I think it was about two and a half years. We worked with them. Sometimes nobody came. Sometimes, as John said, they were high, or they were drunk, or they were suicidal. But in the whole two and a half years, we didn't lose one of those young men. And I think it says something to their courage, actually. Um, I remember the first time we went to, the, to, to this place called the Bull Ring, um, interestingly, <laughs> where we used uh, just a little old room uh, that the older members of the community had been playing bingo in the night before. So it was kind of set up for bingo whenever we went. And we went one particular time and none of the young men had turned up. So Ian and I stayed uh, for the allotted time. And the next week we came back and a few young men turned up. And they were absolutely amazed that we had stayed the week that they hadn't turned up. And there was something about turning up for those young men that really was what the work was about, turning up and staying with them. And. That's kind of what I do as a music therapist. I turn up and uh, I stay. So that's the end of my talk. <laughs> right, I'm going to shoot through some of these slides because I want to get on to the, the, the issue of time because I, what I want to do is think about music from inside the music um, by a slightly circuitous route. but. Um, I've also put quite a few photographs. Some of them are from my first trip over to Bosnia. Some are from Belfast. And I think one or two holiday photos have made their way in as well. But just to rest your eyes from the writing. Yes, I was going to talk a little bit about this, but... It's really summarizing much of what has been said before. This is uh, Mostar. Some general therapeutic effects of music. Um, again, it's a summary of what people have been talking about. I think we know, all of us, what's therapeutic about music. And I think, uh, as someone said earlier, there are so many answers to that question, as, as many answers as there are individuals in this room and beyond. But what I want to note is in music therapy, we have a therapeutic process that's based on a developing relationship between uh, the therapist and the patient, in my case. That's another slide of Musta. Donald Winnicott wrote that we have two ways of living in the world. The first way is our need to adapt to our environment so that we can manage the reality of the world. The second way of living is our need to perceive aspects of here and now in relation to the past. This is a creative process within which we sense the world anew and we come to know what's personally meaningful for us. Now I want to pause briefly and just consider the effect of war and conflict on children. It's 
um, some words from Peter Fonagy. Some traumatized children grow up with an apparent hypersensitivity to mental states, needing to guess immediately what those around them feel and think in order to preempt further trauma. If we consider the impact of this statement, this also opens up for us adults some potentially deeply painful feelings such as guilt, the kinds of things that can accompany war, and a guilt that signposts our own responsibilities, the consequences of our action or inaction, and inevitably larger existential questions about war itself. This is a photograph from some work I did in Mostar with an interpreter. And this was at a time when the Pavarotti Center was at its planning stage. It was a time of curfew, and for me, a tangible feeling of tension, unpredictability, and at times, palpable danger. I met people trying to adjust a to a relative calm after some prolonged violence. Children sometimes screamed into silences that appeared to me to repeat momentary lulls in shelling that had been continuous over days. But when these children were engaged musically, they were able to reconnect with something else, the more playful aspects of who they had been and potentially still could be. As a therapist, both these aspects of responses to silence and sound were important to bear in mind. This slide relates to some of the patients we work, uh, we, we work at my workplace that we work with. Um, we work with a particular population, uh, population of um, patients with severe complex um, psychosis usually, but with, often with an underlying personality disorder, something that also has a relation with the traumatic environments they grew up in and what was going on in society. And as Karen said, there's a generational aspect to that as well. This is from my photo album. Uh, this is the point at which they were collecting the stones from the, the famous bridge in Mostar to rebuild it, and indeed it is now rebuilt. Psychosis is a term that I'm going to use to show how people who are already vulnerable can be further traumatized and how this runs through generations. And one of the other things I want to say about psychosis in, this, in the sense that I'm using the word, it's a state that we all can move in and out of. Uh, what in our family, my family is called a mad five minutes would be a, an example of a kind of manic, psychotic kind of state. But that we can also have a psychotic society. Now I've gone into the second strand of what I wanted to talk about, which is to demonstrate how detailed and layered our thinking can be if we take a musical stance, if we do a kind of musical thinking. And I'm going to focus on one central aspect of music that's repercussions for those traumatized, and that's the experience of time. Music is an art of time. It makes use of repetition in ways that there can be endless subtle variety Musical structures enable us to experience time as it moves forward. To move forward in time is to experience something creative that places us in a kind of flux between what has passed and what is yet to come. Traumatized people are caught in an endless timeless place where there is only repetition but no movement forward. At our most disturbed, time no longer exists for us. We are outside time. We have no sense of ourselves going on being, in time, nor of others. Traumatized patients play a particular kind of music where you can hear this timelessness being played out. 
It's difficult music to hear. It's music that is endless, with no meaning other than a repetitiveness that we can understand only as the traumatic experience itself. This is where music is so appropriate because it is at the very same level that trauma is experienced in the body. But this is an experience not only of the body itself, but the body as it is experienced in or outside time. There's a slide of the Pavarotti Music Center. I'm going to play you part of an improvisation played by a patient who is experiencing quite a severe depression that we later discovered resulted from very early childhood trauma. You will hear the timeless, endless quality of the playing. It is impossible to understand this music because it is formless with repetitive content. And while there is affect, you will get a sense of mood at least from it. It is a diff diffuse sense of something that you may or may not be able to put words onto. So I want you to note as you listen what you may be experiencing inside you. Is it easy to listen to, difficult? What, are the, what, what happens to you when you listen to this? <laughs> 